Hello and welcome. I'm Mr. Eck and you're watching Eck Math. Today we are going to talk about complex numbers. So what is a complex number? Well, we know from before that any real number squared should give you a positive real number answer. 2 squared is positive 4, 5 squared is 11, that's wrong, 5 squared is 25, negative 2 squared is also positive 4, and negative 5 squared is also 25. So that is fine, that lets everything operate perfectly, but we do sort of wonder, could we ever square something and get a negative result? And then we basically are going to ask the question, what if? What if there was some number that we could square it and the result would end up negative. If such a number were to exist, what would the rules of that number be? How could it operate? And how could it help us? It turns out there is such a number, and that number is going to be called i. So our definition of i is the number such that, and then here's our kind of main definition i to the second power will equal negative 1. And this right here is the basis for the complex number system. Um, some other ways we can think about i and its properties are that we can think then if i squared is equal to negative 1, we could write that i itself is equal to the square root of negative 1. This is actually the less uh, used and useful definition because we don't actually really need the idea of square roots to have an idea of i. We're just going to let i be some number that when we square it we get negative 1. That's the main definition. Um, but a lot of people, it is helpful to think about i as the square root of negative 1 even if it's not really technically the right definition. Um, another word that you'll see for i is the imaginary unit. So we'll write that i is the imaginary unit. And when I say unit, I'm not saying like units like unit of measurement, like feet and meters, feet. Uh, I'm talking about unit like one. So it's basically the imaginary version of one, the number one. But it is complex or imaginary. We're going to say that generally a complex number is of the form a plus b times i. And the a and b are both going to be real number coefficients. So we said that i is the imaginary unit, and that kind of forms the basis for all sorts of other complex numbers. Here are some examples of other complex numbers that share this form a plus bi using um, the two parts. Uh, actually, let's talk about the two parts first. These two parts have maybe uh, two separate names. The a is sometimes called the real part, and it's abbreviated re sometimes. And the bi is sometimes called the imaginary part. And it is abbreviated sometimes as IM. So, right, we have the real part and the imaginary part, but added together, they make uh, this thing that we're going to call a complex number. Um, by the way, before we get into too much complex number, uh, I want to talk about the term imaginary. Imaginary is a bad term for these uh, because then people sort of get really excited and they say, oh, you mean these numbers don't exist? Well, guess what? An imaginary number is just as, as real as any number you could think of, right? Like the number five doesn't really exist. You can find five things or five objects, but you're never going to walk down the street and walk into the number five and be like, yes, that really represents the quality of being five. In the same way that you're never going to walk down the street and walk into the number I and be like, that really represents the quantity of being squared to give you negative one. But it's still a number. And in the land of mathematics, it's a number with algebraic rules and we can work with it. So that I think is why we actually prefer the term complex for numbers of this type. 
um, because that's sort of a more official term, and it's not misleading like the term imaginary. I think a mathematician would probably answer that all numbers are imaginary. Um, maybe imaginary with a small i, but only these numbers are imaginary with a capital I. And it's just a different thing. Okay, so I promised you some examples of other complex numbers. How about 2 plus 2i, right? So we could have a and b be the same real number. Um, 4 minus square root of 3i, right? So we said the coefficients are real numbers. That means that the coefficients could be irrational numbers. Those are examples of real numbers. So 4 minus root 3i would work. Um, we could have pi plus 2i, right? So the real part could also be an imaginary number. They could both be, uh, I said imaginary, I meant irrational. They could both be irrational as well. Uh, here's another example, 6i. You might say, well, Mr. Eck, where is the uh, real part? Oh, it's right there. It's 0 plus 6i. So that's also an example of a complex number. Uh, I think sometimes we might call this a purely imaginary number. because it only has the imaginary part, but that's not a really big deal. Uh, and then if you're thinking really carefully, you might know what's coming next. What about seven? Is seven a complex number? Yes, it absolutely is because seven is really in its deepest of hearts, seven plus zero i. And so that's an example of a purely real number, even though they're all part of the complex number system. Um, so these are all good examples of complex numbers. And a complex number is special and unique compared to a standard real number because it does have two parts. It has the, like we said before, the real part and the imaginary part. And because a number has two parts, we can almost think about those A and B as if they are coordinates, which means that complex numbers can actually be drawn not on a number line, right? Real numbers you would draw on a number line. But imaginary or complex numbers, we're going to draw on what's called the complex plane. Here's our little complex plane. So just in the top corner, I've written the, the real number line, right, is a one-dimensional object because real numbers only have one part. But the complex plane has two parts. All complex numbers are of the form A plus BI. So the, what we used to have as the x-axis, we'll call the horizontal axis, that's going to be considered the real axis, and it's abbreviated RE. And then the vertical axis that used to be the y-axis is going to be called the imaginary axis. We abbreviate it as IM. So the real axis is basically where we plot the A value, and the imaginary axis is where we can plot the B value. And so that in general, if I have some complex number A plus BI, I'll put it over here, right? We say a plus bi is plotted at the equivalent coordinate of a comma b on the complex plane. So we can have a lot of numbers on here. Uh, we could have at 1, 1, we could say this is 1 plus i, just saying we're doing like a 1 to 1 scale. Uh, we could have, say that's 4. This could be something like 4 minus, oh, it's a negative 4. That could be something like negative 4 minus i. Uh, and so we could plot each number as a point on the complex plane. Um, we could even plot real numbers. So for example, the real number 2, maybe I should write it as 2 plus 0i, also can exist on this complex plane, and so can purely imaginary numbers. Here would be something like negative 3i uh, plus 0. So basically our complex plane is, uh, you can think about it as being two number lines, a real number line stretched horizontally and a, a complex number line stretched vertically. Um, there are no such things as graphs on the complex plane because uh, this isn't the type of plane where you have an input and an output axis. These are both, uh, or each point on the plane actually represents a single number. So if you wanted to make a graph using the complex plane, you'd have to have, um, for example, you'd have to have two complex planes. You'd actually be looking at some kind of weird four-dimensional sketch. So don't think about the complex plane as a place where we're like gonna draw a parabola. We're not. We're gonna continue drawing graphs on the real plane, uh, but just think about when we see a complex number, know that you can actually plot it not on a number line, 
but on a number plane because complex numbers have two parts. So now I want to look at kind of where complex numbers live in our idea of a number system. So if you think back to, uh, you know, a previous video, a previous class, we started making a map of the number system. I've kind of pre-made this here. We started with the natural numbers, which are uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Then we added the whole numbers, which are those but with 0. Then we added the integers, which are the positive and negative whole numbers. Then we added the rational numbers, which were fractions of integers. I wrote P over Q there to remind you of that. Then we had, in closing all of the rationals, we had the set of real numbers. And then any number that was a real number but was not rational, so sort of like this shaded area, we called irrational. But guess what? And that's where we stopped before. But guess what? There's now an even bigger number system. And it's actually much, much bigger. And that number system is called the complex number system. So real numbers are contained within that entire graph of uh, complex numbers. So complex numbers are anything of the form a plus bi, as we said. And right, real numbers are really just things of the form where i is equal to 0 in an a plus bi. Somewhere over here, maybe there's a subset, right, a little region of this where we have pure imaginaries. Uh, with uh, the a coordinate equals 0, so this would be like 2i, 6i, etc. But in general, the complex number set is the, largest comp is the largest set, and it contains every other set of numbers that we've ever talked about, because it's just basically taking uh, two real numbers and an i and mixing them together with that addition problem. So when we talk about the complex number system, now we're talking about like kind of everything. And this is as there are other number systems out number systems outside of the complex numbers. We are not going to talk about them this year. Complex is as big as we go. Um, oh, one thing that you might see is the complex number system has the symbol fancy double stroke C, uh, right? Remember like some of the symbols, real numbers had the symbol fancy double stroke R, rationals had the symbol fancy double stroke Q. Um, so that add to your list of symbols fancy double stroke C to indicate the complex numbers. Here's a little motivation and context for why we're looking at these right now. So the theme of pre-calculus basically in our class is understanding functions and graphs. And we've been looking at graphs like x cubed, but we, we're kind of tired of those parent functions and just, just moving the same four parent functions around. So we're going to start graphing things that are even more complicated than that. And here's one that we're going to know how to graph that doesn't need complex numbers, something like x cubed minus x. It has the graph I prepared for you earlier. Um, by the way, you can look at this graph, if you think about how x cubed minus x would factor into x, x plus 1, x minus 1, can actually make a lot of sense of the three zeros that you see, right? So we have three factors, we had three natural zeros. The existence of those zeros is actually guaranteed by something called the fundamental theorem of algebra. And the fundamental theorem of algebra says that if we have a polynomial of degree 3, so x cubed being the highest exponent, we are guaranteed 1, 2, 3 zeros. In this case, we had three real zeros, but the fundamental theorem of algebra is not restricted to real numbers. So I took the same graph, shifted it up two units. All I did was literally use what I, I remembered from last section and add two to the entire equation. And now I notice that there's only a single real zero, but that fundamental theorem of algebra actually guarantees us that there are three total zeros. The other two zeros then, because they're certainly not on the real x, y plane, must actually be complex numbers. And we said like the complex plane is not a place where you graph. So it's not like this graph is morphing into the complex plane. It just means that somewhere there are two additional solutions to the equation. Where are we? to the equation x cubed minus x plus 2 equals 0. One of them is the one you see on the graph right there in red, but the other two are imaginary, uh, or not imaginary, they're complex numbers, probably with an a part and a b part. And the main theme of this chapter, actually, what we're doing, going to be doing for the next couple weeks, is figuring out how to take an equation like this, break it down, and solve it. 
So when we start solving these, it's going to be some pretty complex algebra. There's going to be all kinds of uh, numbers floating around, and we are going to need to know basically by heart what to do when we see an imaginary unit, the, the little i, in an equation. How are we going to deal with it when we see it? And that's really the theme of this section 2.1. We're not going to think about graphing, really. We're not really going to think about theory. We're going to focus on the algebra so that when we see all these graphs later, we're not intimidated by the complex solutions. We're just ready to, to rock and roll with them. So first, let's do some arithmetic with complex numbers. Um, and we're going to start by just taking roots of negatives and turning them into complex numbers. Uh, we're going to define the square root of negative a wherever where a is anything, any real number, as uh, the square root of positive a times i or often we'll write it as i root a. It, the order doesn't really matter, it's just multiplication. i root a or uh, root a times i. Um, this is called the principal square root. We've used that term before. Uh, it's called the principal square root of the complex number. And there is actually um, a related rule, like if I was taking the square root of negative 1, Technically, that would be i or minus i, right? There is such a thing as a minus i. We could examine it on the complex plane. But when we see this root here, you imagine that it's the positive imaginary version of it, not the negative imaginary version. So just something to watch out for. Not a big deal. It doesn't really come up as a problem, but watch out for it. Um, so square root of negative a is root a times i. That's where we want to be so far. So let's apply that. Square root of negative 25 would then be the square root of 25 times i. Square root of 25 now can be simplified to 5 times i. If I had something like the square root of minus 7, I would write that as the square root of minus, uh, nope, square root of 7 times i. Now in this case, square root of 7 is just the square root of 7. It doesn't reduce, it doesn't simplify. So then it would really just be root 7i, or often we would write it as i root 7, just moving the root to the end so that uh, it doesn't, the i doesn't accidentally like get underneath the, the little symbol. Um, but either would be fine here. I can tell you what I often see as an error. Common error is writing that the square root of negative 7 is equal to 7i. Right, so I think a lot of people associate the square root as kind of going with the i, but it doesn't. It also has to track with the number part two. Uh, so square root of negative seven is i root seven because we're still rooting the seven. Um, if I wanted to actually get seven i, seven i, that would be the square root of negative 49 because then when you square root the 49, you get the seven, the negative gives you the i. So that's just turning roots into complex numbers. Complex numbers are numbers, so we can also just add and subtract them at, at will, pretty much. Uh, so say I had 5 plus i plus 4 minus 2i. We can combine, right? So this is just addition. This is addition, addition, and subtraction. And other than the subtraction, it's all commutative. So I don't actually need these grouping symbols. I can write this as 5 plus i plus 4 minus 2i. Then uh, you can group the real parts. And you can simplify, 5 plus 4 is still 9, and i minus 2i, you're just going to treat the i like an x. So this is going to be negative i, and I would write the final answer then as something like 9 minus i. So for addition and subtraction, just treat i like any other variable. You group it, combine like terms with it, just everything you would normally do, you can do with i. And that's part of the beauty of taking this strange exotic object and giving it this like nice little variable name, is we can now start to work with it and figure out its rules and figure out how it works. This is kind of the essence of discovery in mathematics. Let's see what happens if we start to multiply some complex numbers. I'm going to use the same ones and just switch the symbol in between here. So we have 5 plus i 
times the quantity 4 minus 2i. Again, these are two complex numbers. We're multiplying them together. Um, so, you know, you could think about this as like C1 times C2, just multiplying numbers together. Now, in this case, we can't just do, all right, C1 times C2 and multiply the parts. We have to distribute. So I'll go step by step. And as you get faster at this, you'll probably be able to do this in your head and do it a lot faster than I'm going to do it right now. The 5 times the 4, we distribute and get 20. The 5, oh, new color. The 5 times the minus 2i is going to be minus 10. We just multiply the coefficients i, right? We're treating that i just as if it's any other variable. The i times the 4 is going to be plus 4i. And the i times the minus 2i, this is the only one that's a little different, but in this step it's not even that strange. It's going to be minus 2, multiply the coefficients, i squared, multiply the i's, right, just as if it was an x. Now let's combine like terms a little bit. So this will be 20, uh, minus 10 plus 4 is minus 6i, minus 2i squared. Now if this was an x, we would be done, but it's not an x. Remember our key definition for i was that i squared equals negative 1. No matter where you see that i, that's always going to be true. So anytime we get an i squared, to proceed with simplifying, oh, what's that? Proceed with simplifying, we are just going to replace that i squared with a minus 1. That ends up being a plus 2. So then this is going to be final answer, whoop, 22 minus 6 i. And so notice that when I multiplied two complex numbers, I did have to go through this whole procedure of distributing, but I didn't end up with a three term. I ended up with another complex number, which I think is pretty cool, right? There's actually some really neat geometric properties of complex multiplication that we're going to cover later on in the year. Uh, but since this isn't really more of just an introduction, introduction, we're not going to get too far into those. But um, if you were to plot those three numbers in the complex plane, some cool things would happen. I'll just I'll say as a hint. There's one other cool part of multiplication. So this is the part of multiplication that kind of behaves like the number part. There's another part of multiplication when you have uh, now our numbers have two parts. That is more like what happens when we multiplied a plus b the polynomial times a minus b. So we now can have complex numbers that have complex conjugates. And so, let me make some space here. You'll often see the word complex. Attached to the word conjugate to say, hey, we're looking at this complex number uh, and what would its conjugate be? Okay, so conjugate is the I is the uh, pattern where if if this is complex number one complex number two is the same number with the sign in the middle change right so if we had four minus two i we're going to multiply by four plus two i now i've set this up already let's just see what happens when we distribute this out so i'll get 16 minus eight i and i'll do these together and I'll get plus 4i, sorry, we'll do these together, and get 4 plus 2i is plus 8i, and then we'll do these together and get minus 4i to the second power. So then what has now happened is I had a minus 8i, boom, and a plus 8i, those just subtract to make 0 as before, so we end up with 16 minus 4i squared. However, i squared is negative 1. So this is really like 16 plus 4. We actually end up with just 20, the real number. So conjugate multiplication uh, is a way to have two complex numbers eventually equal a real number, which is extremely useful because we don't, you know, complex numbers are a wonderful number system, but we don't always want them in our equations. So when you see this complex pattern, 
this conjugate pattern, you should be really happy because it means in the end that the i's are going to cancel out or become squared. And every time you can get something to cancel or you can get an i squared, that gets you like less and less complex numbers. Let's do a couple more examples of this because this is probably the most important idea of the section is these ideas of complex conjugate. Um, a lot of people think that you have to change the sign on the imaginary part. That's not actually true. So uh, you can also have a conjugate with the sign changed on the real part if it's written second. It's really just about how it's written rather than what it is, is multiplied to. So let's distribute this out. Then I would get i squared first. I would, then I would have minus 1i plus 1i. And then I would have minus 1. Right? i squared minus i plus i minus 1 i squared is equal to minus 1. These two reduce with each other, so I really have minus 1 minus 1, or just good old negative 2. So it can happen if you're multiplying with conjugates. You can get, again, a real number. In this case, it's a negative real number. In the other case, it was a positive real number. But importantly, it's a real number. Here's the general pattern, and I'm just going to give you the general pattern for if we, we have uh, the eyes coming second, not the eyes coming first, like in, the, you know, in this example. That is kind of a, a weird case, but the most general example is if we have a plus bi times a minus bi, and you recognize this pattern, let's just do this in the most general way, and then we can have a pattern we can use forever and ever. So that's going to give you a squared minus abi plus abi minus b i squared b squared i squared right so b i times b i we're going to get minus b squared i squared then these will reduce out i squared is negative one and then negative one times negative one makes a positive so in the end this all comes together and is just going to be equal to a squared plus b squared with no i, right? So when we're doing a complex conjugate, this is going to be a real number, no i's. That's pretty awesome. Um, and having that shortcut lets us do com conjugate multiplication really quickly. So if I just make up a problem on the spot, like 6 plus 4i times 6 minus 4i, if I recognize this pattern, a plus bi, a minus bi, I know that this is going to be 6 squared plus 16 squared, nope, sorry, 4 squared, getting ahead of myself, which will be 36 plus 16, which will be 40, 52. And once you recognize that pattern, you can then do this conjugate multiplication without even, you know, blinking. You don't have to foil the thing out once you recognize that a squared plus b squared pattern. Now that we know about conjugates, we can also do division of complex numbers. So division is just saying, hey, take your two numbers and put them in a fraction. So I might be trying to do 1 minus i divided by 5 plus i, and it would, it would be really foolish to try to set this up in like a, some kind of weird long division problem, right? Like, no way. That ain't going to happen. But what if we just take these numbers and put them in a fraction with each other? This would be equivalent to the division problem. So let's do the fraction problem. Now, I wrote as a hint that you can think about rationalizing because we had the, the general idea that i is equal to the square root of minus 1. But don't actually put that root in there because that's going to make everything way more complicated. And it is better to just stay in terms of i with the starred idea that whenever we get an i squared, it is equal to negative 1. That's the move to do here. But when we were rationalizing things with multiple parts on the bottom, what do we use? We use the conjugate. Conj I can't spell it. Conjugate of 5 plus i. So the conjugate of 5 plus i is 5 minus i. Let's multiply that in. I multiply that in to the top and the bottom. Now I know that when I do, because of what we just put on a slide, 5 plus i times 5 minus i, that's going to be a squared plus b squared. 
So in this case, it's going to be 5 squared plus 1 squared, or 26. So the denominator of my fraction is going to just be 26. That's the product of the conjugates. For the numerator, I'm going to have to multiply it out. So it's going to be uh, 5i, boom, minus i squared. At this point, it doesn't really matter the order you do it in. Just make sure you're doing four things times four things. That's going to be minus 5, the real number, and then plus i. Uh, let's see. Minus i squared would equal positive 1, since i squared would be negative 1. And 5i plus i would be 6i. So I've got a positive 1, a minus 5, a 5i, and a 6i. So all together, I should have negative 4 plus 6i over 26. Now that's the answer to the division problem. There's one more step that you ought to do, uh, which is the problem will ask you to express your result in a plus bi form. So we're going to split the real part and imaginary part instead of leaving them as one big fraction. Make this negative 4 over 26 plus 6 over 26. We'll write a 6i over 26. And then final step, uh, and this is required. You definitely have to do this to be, to be thoroughly done. You've got to reduce all your fractions. So this would be negative 2 thirteenths plus 3 thirteenths i. And if the problem asked you to give, like, here's the A or B, the A is negative 2 thirteenths, and the B is 3 thirteenths. Not 3 thirteenths I, just the coefficient is 3 thirteenths. Um, and that's the result of the division problem. So you do complex division by multiplying, write it as a fraction, and then multiply by the conjugate. That's going to get the complex number out, then just make sure you simplify everything further, and almost always you'll have to reduce your fractions. So just remember, remember to reduce those fractions. We're nearing the end here, but there's one other cool feature about i, which is that uh, you can, of course, take like, like a variable, like any x, you can take any power of i, and it will have a, a defined value. So it actually works best to build up i to the 1 is just i, right? We're not, it's not square root negative 1. We're not writing that here. We're writing that i to the 1 is just i. It's itself. i squared, by definition, is negative 1, right? That was our definition of i. Just that's what it is. So what about i to the third? Well, i to the third is i squared times i, right? So that would be negative 1 times i, which we would just write as negative i. So i to the third is negative i. Okay, so I'm kind of getting like some of the numbers back. That's interesting. What about i to the fourth? Well, you can break up i to the fourth in a lot of ways, but I like to think about it as i squared times i squared. That's negative one times negative one. That's, oh my goodness, just one. And that's really important because what about i to the fifth? Well, i to the fifth would be i to the fourth times i, but what was i to the fourth? One. So i to the fifth is i. And hopefully you're starting to see why I made this uh, a table on my page four columns long, because i to the first and i to the fifth are always going to be the same thing. And since we started with i to the first and built out, Everything in the lower columns here is going to match with everything above it. So i to the sixth is going to equal negative one because it's just i times i to the fifth times another i. Well, we already did that work. That was um, right. I to the fifth times i is negative is uh, i times i is negative one. Right. So it all reduces out, and we write that i to the seventh would then equal negative i, and i to the eighth would equal 1. And we can use this power to, once you can figure out kind of where you are in the chart, you can say, all right, what about something like i to the uh, 35th? 
How would you do I to the 35th using this chart? Well, you'd think about 35. I to the 35th, you could think about as being I to the 32nd times I to the 3rd. I to the 32nd is the same as I to the 4 times 8, or 4 to the 8. So this whole piece, the 32nd part, is just going to be 1. It's going to contribute 1. I to the 3rd, we know what I to the 3rd is. It's negative I. So I to the 35th really would just simplify to negative I. Uh, and you could do this for any number you want. Just figure out kind of where you are in the sequence of, of uh, 4, and you, there you go. Uh, so that's the cool fact about powers of i. Probably don't need it in this section, but it's a really neat property of i. And when we start coming back and looking at these on the complex plane, it's probably the most important property of i later on in math. Here's another interesting question, and this was actually posed to me by a student. And the question goes like this. Sorry, I had to change it real quick. Um, if I was doing the square root of negative 25 times the square root of negative 4, so I'm going back to multiplying, but not in i form, in square root form, wouldn't there be two ways to solve it? Uh, the first way would be using the i form, so square root of 25, negative 25 could be written as root 25i, which is 5i, and square root negative 4 could be written as root 4i, which is the same as 2i, then combining all those together, it's 5 times 2 times i squared, which would give you negative 10. That's method 1. But they said, what about method 2? Couldn't we just combine everything under one root right at the start? Then that's square root of negative 25 times negative 4 is positive 100. And wouldn't this just be 10? Like, which is it? It feels like if I do a multiplication problem, not, not doing weird division, I'm doing straight up ordinary multiplication, I should have a single answer. I shouldn't have this quandary. Um, and so I had to think about it. Could both be true? What could be what could be going on? Um, and I consulted my sources, and then I saw something in our textbook on page 34, which is not the page on complex numbers. That's the page on square roots. The product rule for complex numbers, that is what we used in method B, look at what it really says. If A and B represent non-negative real numbers, then we can do this, or specifically we can do this. But what did A and B represent in our problem? They represented negative real numbers. So this rule does not apply here. And I, I actually believe that this case is the reason the rule does not apply. Uh, but regardless, the rule does not apply. And so method two actually uh, is going to be by definition incorrect. And if we were doing this problem, the only correct result of root negative 25 times root negative four would be negative 10 as shown here. So that's just something to watch out for. Um, you know, when you're we're thinking moving around with these eyes, always get it into the I form first, then go ahead and proceed with your algebra. If you stay in square root form too long, you risk breaking some rules of square roots that uh, we might not even be thinking about as we're breaking them. I want to close today by coming back to the idea of graphing. So we said, hey, why do we care about complex number arithmetic? For us right now, it's because it's going to enable us to fully, fully solve all kinds of equations finding all zeros all around. And it turns out that the key to this, to solving all equations, is going to be solving quadratic equations. So of the form ax squared plus bx plus c, but this time the solutions are allowed to be imaginary. So probably the most important thing you're going to want to remember is the good old quadratic formula. And when you first saw the quadratic formula, you know, you've probably used it a bunch of times. There's no rule in this formula that says that any of these terms have to be positive or have to be real. So the quadratic formula is pretty cool because it will also give us all of the imaginary zeros for a quadratic. And if everything works right, this quadratic I have prepared over here should give us some really nice zeros. I'm going to write it over here. Uh, so A is 1 b is 2, and c is 5. 
So if I substitute into the quadratic formula, it should be negative 2 plus or minus the square root of b squared is 4 minus 4ac, so that should be 4 times 1 times 5, all over 2a, so just 2. Now let's carefully simplify this. This is going to end up uh, as negative 16 all over 2. All right, so I'm going to do a little scratch work. Root negative 16 over here would be root 16i, which would simplify to 4i. So that's right. This is previously where we would stop and be like, oh, no, no real solutions. I quit. Just keep going. Let's just do the problem uh, now that we know what to do with that negative 16. So then this is going to be negative 2 plus or minus 4i all over 2. As always, oh yes, oh yes, as always, reduce your fractions. This is the step This like where a lot of people lose points, and it's frustrating because they've clearly understood the complex number system. They just didn't do the last step. The last step here would be to write this, you can split it up as negative 2 over 2 plus or minus 4i over 2. Split that fraction up, and then we'd have negative 1 plus or minus 2i. And if I really want to write the two solutions, um, I'll write them over here. You can write them as separate numbers. 1, negative 1 plus 2i, and negative 1 minus 2i. So these are the solutions for this quadratic graph. And uh, there's one thing I can tell about this quadratic graph. I haven't even graphed this. I don't know what the graph looks like, but I know that it has two imaginary solutions, which means it has no real solutions. It's also opening upwards because it's positive x squared. So I know just from this mathematics that the graph had better be looking something like this. I don't know exactly what quadrant, but that's the visual you're looking, thinking about when you have those two imaginaries is a, a parabola that doesn't touch that x-axis anywhere. Um, but you can use that quadratic formula as long as you're careful and you're reducing everything and you're using good properties of I that will solve quadratics in no time. I actually prefer for complex numbers, at least when the coefficient out here is 1, I don't like the quadratic formula. I think completing the square is much easier. And so, right, if you're going to be a really agile problem solver, you probably want to have all possible methods in your pocket. So here's the same problem done with completing the square, just to prove how much simpler it actually is. Write this as x squared plus 2x equals negative 5, right? Subtract 5 over, just like before. Then I'm going to fill in this blank with something. What will I fill it in with? Well, I have to do b over 2 and square it. In this case, that's 1. So I add 1 to both sides. Now I can express this as it's a perfect square, x plus 1 quantity squared equals negative 4. Now again, this is where I would have gotten stuck last time because I'm about to take the square root. But I can now keep going. x plus 1 is the positive. Notice how I'm taking the square root. I put a plus minus here, and I take the square root of the negative 4. root negative 4 is going to be the same as root 4i, which is going to be the same as 2i. So this is really plus minus 2i, right? So the plus minus here is because I took that root, the negative underneath is what gives us the i, and we still have x plus 1. So I guess I had to zoom out one tick here. x would equal negative 1 plus or minus 2i which are the exact same solutions I got earlier, right? Same solutions. I thought this was easier. So if you're able to complete the square, like you're comfortable with it, it can save you some from, a, from some annoying fractions, basically. Um, and I would really recommend it as a method to have in your pocket. All right, we're almost done. Just to kind of recap, or why do we care about this? I said this before. Uh, but this is the example we started the day with of, you know, hey, what are we going to use complex numbers for? We know that 
There's one real zero, so there must be two complex zeros. If you know how to find the complex roots of a quadratic, we're going to teach you all the methods for finding the complex roots of anything because what happens with x cubed? Well, once we divide out this real zero, right? We do, it's going to be x plus, uh, I guess it's going to be x plus 1.521. I can see the coordinate on here. If I divide that out, and we'll teach you how, once that's divided out, uh, then what do we end up with? We end up with a quadratic. So as long as you can solve quadratics, it's actually all you need to find all sorts of complex zeros. So that's why we need to know how to work with i, we need to know how to simplify it, and we basically just need to know how to use the quadratic formula. All right, folks, that's it for today. Thanks for watching. Hope this has helped with complex numbers. Um, you know, it's really just an introduction. There's so much more to this topic. Uh, if you're curious, you're welcome to just search it up and read ahead. Um, but there are literally entire courses you can take in university about complex numbers and how they work and how they operate. They're very nifty things. We're just dipping our toe in, but this is like really, really awesome math that we're doing right now. So uh, I'm really excited to be doing it with you guys. Uh, let me know what questions you have, and I'll see everyone next time.